This is study number two of the New Testament entitled, The Word Became Flesh. We're going to do this study in one segment followed by a discussion time. But this picture is really just a demonstration uh, in a general way of what John wrote in his gospel. And uh, that is such a powerful set of verses uh, that are written in your Bethel notebook with regard to this picture that uh, it would be good to have that in your memory. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you skip down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. All right, uh, those are wonderfully strong, grace-filled words. And they tell us that uh, Jesus Christ is God, and they tell us that Jesus Christ is also one who came in human flesh. He is man. And what we're going to emphasize is, in this study, is how that can be and how the church dealt with that in ancient times and uh, because it has relevance for the church of today. So I'm going to begin by giving you two questions that we're going to deal with before we look at our study sheet. The first question is the question that Jesus gave to his disciples when they went alone with him up north and east of the Sea of Galilee into a spot called Philippi Caesarea. You remember the text. Jesus' ministry had gone on for quite a period of time now. And he took them away to be with him. <clears throat> and they went up to the spot where they could, well, when we were there some years ago, we could see Mount Hermon. And in that beautiful spot, Jesus gave them the question, which in your Bethel material, Dr. Harley Swiggum says is the question of the ages. It is the most important question for any one person to answer. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? It makes a difference as to how we answer that question. So we're going to take a look at that. And then we're going to take a look at the question of what is God like? Now, I don't know about you, but I think that if we would just ask a cross-section of people that maybe we have at the, at the job where we work, or if you would go somewhere where you would get people who are just uh, representative people of society, and you would get into a religious discussion, and you would ask them the question about what is God like, that you get a whole variety of answers. And I've got a little book in my library by J.B. Phillips. It's called, Your God is Too Small. And in that book written by J.B. Phillips, he lists a whole number of images or ideas that people typically have in society as to what God is like. And he calls them very unuseful, as a matter of fact, disruptive kind of images, because they don't square with what we know God to be like. And people will come back and say, well, everybody has got their idea about what God is like, but nobody really knows. How would you answer that? The Christian answer is that we do know what God is like. You recall last week we talked about the Hebraic thought form and the Hellenistic thought form. And one of those comparison factors was reason on the part of the Hellenistic type of thinking. And the counterpart on the other side was what? Revelation. The Christian belief is this. God has made himself known. We do not have to guess as to what God is like. And he has made himself known primarily in two avenues. 
the word written and, as you know, the word made flesh. So you and I can know if we believe the scriptures that if you really want to know what God is like, you just do what your assignments are calling you to do is to go through the Gospels. Take a look at what Jesus said. Listen to those words. See how he related to people. Find out what his values were. Take a look in terms of what kind of an attitude he carried when he was faced with obstacles. And he was. He was faced with opposition. An opposition that brought him to the cross ultimately. Take a look at the Gospels. You find Jesus Christ there. And what you see there is what God is like. It's as simple and as profound as that. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. John writes, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the way through scripture, it's stated that we can know what God is like and Jesus Christ portrays it for us in very understandable, specific, human life <coughs> terms. You know, you gotta pinch yourself and say, wow, that's just as important a question as the one that Jesus posed. What is God like? And we have an answer to it. We can believe that we know what God is like. That's comforting. That is wonderfully great. Okay, let's take the second question. Who do people say that I am? Now the question is, what is Jesus like? Who is he? And I'll have to tell you that on the list that we had last week, where we talked about the Hebraic way of thinking and the Hellenistic thought form, contrasting those, I gave you seven things. On this study, we need to add a very important one to the list. It's number eight, and it is this. The Hellenistic way of thinking posits that matter is evil. The material world is evil. This is not on your study sheet. This is a little extra for free material I'm giving you now, and you're taking notes, and that's well, well uh, worthwhile. So you put down the statement that matter is evil. The human body is evil because that is part of the material world. Now, if you recall the Old Testament study number one, and you remember that picture, and you remember the globe, that represented God's total creation. What was on the top of that globe? There was a halo, right? And that halo was the artist's way of reminding us that the Bible says seven times in the first chapter of Genesis that God's creation is good. And the seventh time, the writer as though to underscore it indelibly said, and it was very good. So all the way through scripture, that theme is repeated. God's creation, the material world, our human bodies are not evil. They are created good. Now we live in a fallen world. Make no mistake about the fact that our material world has been impacted by the fallenness of creation and the fallenness of human life. But notice what the New Testament does when it talks about the thing called money. Does the New Testament tell us that money is evil? It does not. It says the love of money is evil. So that's a good illustration of the biblical motif that it is not that God's creation per se is evil, not that the body is evil, it is the misuse of these material things that 
creates the havoc and produces the evil. Now, a hedonist, for example, uh, makes a god out of the body, a playboy world type of thing. Now, the body is good, but if you make a god out of the body, if you misuse the body, if misappropriate the body, you, you don't follow God's guidelines with regard to the use of your body, then obviously evil comes. But that does not change the fact that the body itself is not evil. You've got to know that, or you won't understand why some of the difficulty came in with regard to this whole matter of the question, is Jesus really human? Did Jesus really have a genuine human body? We're going to take a look at that in a second. But now, just to follow on in my thought, if the hedonist makes a, a, a god out of the body, a materialist makes a god out of the material things of life. And then, of course, it becomes an evil thing. It produces evil. But the material world itself is created of God. Now, why did I spend so much time dealing with that eighth contrast? Because in the early Christian church, with a Hellenistic influence, there were groups of people within the Christian church as it moved on toward the time of the first century and into the second century who began to answer the question of who is Jesus in a way that showed a greater influence of Hellenistic thinking than the influence of scriptural thinking. All right? Are you still with me? You've got to have your thinking caps on for this particular segment of our study. But it's important because those groups that we're now going to talk about that began to bring in these other influences that impacted and distorted their view of the humanness and the divineness of Jesus Christ are groups that are with us today under a different name to be sure. But history repeats itself. And just because somebody comes to your door and hands you some literature and you look at it and you say, well, this looks just exactly like the kind of thing I had in Sunday school. And they're quoting the Bible and the name of Jesus is in here. Why, hey, this is a good group. The real question is, what do they really mean when they talk about Jesus Christ? Who, how do they answer the question? And many times those groups would really fit into the pattern of what I'm going to call three unique descriptions or answers that people give in terms of the question, who do people say that I am? So take your study sheet and let's go into that. Number one, the first group that we're going to look at, you don't have to remember the name, but they were called the Ebionites. You don't find people today asking, are you an Ebionite? <laughs> Obviously, nobody knows what that word means anymore. <laughs> but here's the concept, and that's the thing we need to get a hold of. They believed that Jesus was fully human, but he was not fully divine. See the, you remember what this picture says? This picture says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. John is saying, Jesus Christ is fully God and Jesus Christ is fully human. Now, we can't really compute that. I understand that. People dealt with it and they began to say, well, he was fully human, but he was not God. And so they had to do some tampering in their interpretation of, of all those passages of Scripture that uh, affirm that Jesus Christ is God. 
Jesus was put to the cross because he claimed to be God. And they rent their clothes in the Sanhedrin. Said, this is blasphemy. He claims to be God. Jesus said, you have said that I am. He accepted the description that he was very God. So, uh, these people that said he is fully human, but he's not divine, believe that at the time of his baptism, God's Holy Spirit came on him and he was elevated to some kind of human life that was more than normal. No one had really ever reached that level. So they, they saw him being elevated. And then in the Mount of Transfiguration, that was the second time that a voice of the Father from the heaven said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Again, at that moment on the top of Mount Transfiguration, he was elevated some more. So they really believed that he was an elevated human being, but not, not God. Now take a look at your sheet. The church, when they saw this kind of thinking being spread among some of their people, called a church council. This is in 325 A.D. in Nicaea. And representatives came together and they spent months together praying, studying the Bible, discussing, asking for God's guidance. And they hammered out after all of these long, long hours what we call the Nicene Creed. Well, I read through the Nicene Creed and I picked out a phrase which is pointed to this group, which indicates that their thinking is off base. Here is the phrase. Christ is of the same essence as the Father. He is very God of very God. Now, I've lifted that right out of that creed. And so they labeled that kind of thinking as heretical. And you don't have to go far to find biblical substantiation for what the Nicene fathers uh, put down in the creed with regard to that first heretical answer to who Jesus Christ is. Okay? Well, you're rolling along great, so let's go for number two. <laughs> Jesus was fully divine, but he was not fully human. Now the tables are turned just exactly the other way. And uh, so they put the emphasis on the fact that uh, he was God, fully God. And he only appeared to be human. He only acted as though he was tired. He only uh, seemed like he was hungry. And when he went into the temptations, no contest. Satan can't deal with God. So he went through the motions of being tempted, but the outcome was totally obvious. It was not a genuine temptation. He could not sin. He was God. End of case. That's how their thinking went. Now, in 451 AD, there was another church council. This is the fourth one, actually. And they addressed this heresy, and they made this statement. Christ was perfect in humanness. Humanness, my spell check on my word processor kicked that out and said, there isn't such a word. <laughs> well, <laughs> the Chalcedonian people said we're gonna coin a new word. And there it is, his humanness. That is to say that he was actually a human being, a man, and of the same reality as we ourselves, like us in all respects, sin accepted. Well, they just hit that heresy right straight on and said, this is not the Christ of Scripture. The Christ of Scripture is fully human. And we're going to discuss that in a little bit, but I've given you some 
verses of scripture on this passage uh, here on the bottom of the sheet uh, that really say it in very straightforward terms. And uh, one of the favorites, I guess, comes out of the Gospels where you read that Jesus at age 12 was in the temple. And it is true that he had some very good answers to the questions of the people in the temple there, the mucky mucks of the religious uh, establishment, uh, that they were impressed with his words. But he, it also says that he asked them questions. And then Luke, the physician, Luke is a physician, and he writes that Jesus increased or grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew. Now it's interesting that some of the artists who followed this, he's totally God but not human, some of those artists that were uh, somewhat imbued by this particular uh, field of thought, and that field of thought is called docetism. <laughs> You gotta remember that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, of course. This field of thought influenced the artists so that when they portrayed Jesus, they portrayed him in the cradle, but like a, a little adult, a miniature adult. See the influence of this kind of thinking. And so we go to the third one. Jesus was a split personality, a type of of schizophrenic. Okay? Sometimes he functioned as a being fully human. Sometimes he functioned as a being fully divine. It depended on whether his human nature or divine nature was dominant at that particular time. And so you've got the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sometimes uh, totally divine and that's when he did the miracles and sometimes totally human and that's when he was tempted and that's when he got hungry and he needed to have sleep and uh, so that's that's what they began to do and I took a quote from an excellent little book now the, it's terrible but the little books that I love are all out of print and the, the book dealer told me this week this book is out of print The Meaning of Christ by Robert Clyde Johnson and uh, for those of you who do like to pick up books like that, uh, it's The Meaning of Christ. And the author is Robert C. Johnson. It is another treasure in my estimation. It is just a terrific book. And I give you a quote from his book the, as he deals with these various kinds of schisms and heretical positions. And he makes a statement about this schizophrenic kind of answer to who Jesus Christ is. He's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sometimes he's divine, sometimes he's human, depends on what he's doing. His quote is as follows, the church always has been squeamish about attempts to psychoanalyze Jesus or to simplify him by identification of what in him was divine and what was human. The framers of the early creeds pointedly refused to be lured into this temptation and in grateful awe they affirmed the mystery that he is very God and he is very man. Now when he refers to the creeds, he would be uh, uh, very much uh, in tune with the creed of Chalcedon and I give you the quote on your paper here, Christ has two natures. Now notice what the framers of that creed said, without confusing them, without transmuting one nature into the other, without dividing them into two separate categories. And now listen to this, without contrasting them according to area or function. Well, that had to make them squirm, the people who were doing that kind of psychoanalyzing of Jesus Christ. All right, now we're going to have time to talk about this. And so the questions that you've got on the bottom of your sheet are numbered one, two, three, four, five. And the bottom 
three I have given you responses to. The top two are open, and that's where you come in. <laughs> and I want you to deal with these two questions in our discussion time. Is it intellectually possible to understand how Christ could be fully human and fully divine? Okay, that may be a simple one for you to respond to. Number two, it has been said that to understand Christ, we must stand under Christ. Notice the play on words there. That comes out of uh, Robert Johnson's little book. It's a, it, it's a gem of a statement. To understand Christ, we must stand under Christ. And I wonder if you've got some ideas as to what that means when you hear that said. So what does that statement mean to you is the question. And with that, we're going to stop and go into our discussion. Let's take a minute to take a look at these two questions and to uh, make a few summary comments. I'm going to give you what is my thinking, my belief with regard to these two questions. The answer that I hold for that answer to the first question about whether we can intellectually put our arms around the understanding that Jesus is fully God and fully man, all that in one person. Uh, I refer to the passage in 1 Timothy 3.16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. He was manifest in the flesh. <clears throat> I took uh, commentary down from the shelf to find out, you know, what a biblical scholar would have to say about that verse as it relates to the Incarnation, because he's talking about the Incarnation. He's, he calls it a mystery. And uh, this is what the uh, commentator said, the mystery has been made known, and yet how incomprehensible we discover it to be. So my personal belief is that the Incarnation is, uh, defies full intellectual understanding. But we bow before it in awe. God is bigger than our finite minds can comprehend, and that's great. So that's where I am. Now the second question is kind of piggybacks on this, and that's a comment uh, that uh, I indicated is in Robert Johnson's little book, The Meaning of Jesus Christ. He, he, he gives us that phrase. And here is his comment. The meaning of Christ is disclosed to us only as we offer him our lives. Now in your discussion, some of you were throwing that particular viewpoint in, and then he quotes Karl Barth. In this knowing, we are not masters, but we are mastered. We must stand under the message that God unveils in Christ in order to understand it. So I guess it's Karl Barth who coined the phrase and Johnson is using it from him. And then he wraps it up by saying, in other areas of life, it is neither necessary nor desirable always to take personally whatever what someone says. Understanding Christ is uniquely different. We must take him personally or we do not understand him at all. Now, let me put it in my own words. <clears throat> when we stand under Christ, we take him by faith, even though we may not intellectually understand how he can be fully God and fully man. We take him by faith, and we walk with him, and our heart begins to understand what our mind could not wrap its tentacles around. I think that's what that says. And that's in, true in my experience. And that's good. That's good. And we have a God who is greater than our minds can fully understand. And that's the end of this segment. And we'll turn in a few moments to study number three. This is New Testament study number three, entitled Jesus the Man. First off, we're going to use the teaching picture. And the kneeling figure that you have before you in that teaching picture is obviously Jesus of Nazareth. The New Testament portrays Jesus Christ 
very, very clearly as a historical figure. He was born in Bethlehem and a Roman emperor by name of Augustus had ordered that a census be taken and they needed to go to Bethlehem for that census. He grew up in a place that you can visit today called Nazareth. He was at the Sea of Galilee and all the way through you have all the events of Jesus life and death rooted in history. And so we normally assume that to be solid and take that for granted. But lo and behold, you find that there are many people round about who don't believe that there was a Jesus of Nazareth. That that actually was something that just kind of grew up among the Christian community. And so the Gospels assumed it and the New Testament writers uh, took it along and, and you don't find secular historians referring to it. So does the Christian community really know for sure that there was a Jesus of Nazareth who lived in the first century, who was born in Bethlehem, and who died in Jerusalem, and was crucified outside the city? Well, I began to ask myself the question when I was in college. I read a person uh, who was a religious figure in India, and maybe you remember the name, Mahatma Gandhi. And here is what he said. I have never been interested in a historical Jesus. I should not care if it were proved by someone that Jesus never lived and, and that what was narrated in the Gospels were a figment of the writer's imagination. For the Sermon on the Mount would still be true for me, Mahatma Gandhi. So we need to, if we are going to be people who are able to speak to others and to respond to questions, we need to be able. Why do you believe <laughs> that Jesus actually lived and that he is a historical person? Because otherwise, we are just like the people of the Hellenistic world with all of the Greek philosophy and all of the Greek mythology where they had, especially in the mythology, all kinds of gods that were really the figment of the imagination of a writer here and a writer there, and pretty soon it takes on a life of its own, and they talk about these gods as though they really did exist. So the historicity of Christ rooted in history is very, very significant and important. And I want to read a, a little quip from David Watson's book, Jesus Then and Now. There are, if this is meaningful for you, three Roman historians who lived in the first century and shortly thereafter who did write about Jesus Christ. A passing reference. And the reason it wasn't given a lot of press is, I think, easy to understand. You see, we stand now at a time in history where the Christian faith is a faith that permeates the whole world and millions of people are followers of Jesus Christ. But in that day, considering the population of that area, it was a handful. And so historians thought, well, this is a sect of the Jewish religion, and so what else is new? I mean, it isn't noteworthy, and why should I write about it? So that's why a lot of historians did not pay attention. But let me read the words of one of those historians who did mention it. His name is Tacitus, and uh, he writes, during the time of Nero, and this is after the time of Christ, it's at the turn of the century, and he talks about the Christians who were suffering for their faith in this Jesus Christ who died and then rose again. 
So he writes, Nero, punished with utmost refinement of cruelty, a class hatred for their abominations, who are commonly called Christians. Christus, from whom their name is derived, was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. That's right, out of a Roman historian, a secular historian, who makes note of it. And then, of course, you've got historians like Pliny the Younger, and you have Suetonius, who also make references to a Christus that we know to be Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then the Jewish historian Josephus, who has written so voluminously about this whole period, because he was born shortly after Christ died. So he lived in that Christian era, died about 100 AD. Josephus was anti-Christian. He really had no great love for the Christian people. But Josephus did write up in his book called The Antiquities of the Jews these things. At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous, and many people from among the Jews and from other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to die and crucified him, and those who became his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. So much from Josephus. These are historians that I've quoted who really had no vested interest in perpetuating the Christian faith. But they are historians and they take note of Jesus. Now one of my favorite authors and I promise you this is the last quote I'm going to read, <laughs> is, is F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, New Testament uh, expositor. And he, in his book, Jesus, Lord and Savior, he makes this statement. The Christian faith, if disunited from the Jesus of history, is apt to be a figment of the pious imagination. Shades of Greek mythology. The pious imagination, like any other kind of imagination, is an unsafe basis for faith and history alike. We must begin then with the historical Jesus, a real man of flesh and blood who lived his life something over 30 years at a particular time and place in the first few decades of the Christian era in the land of Israel. End of case. <laughs> All right. That is something for you to have in your treasure chest in terms of, well, we believe it because it's in the Bible. But when you dialogue with other people who say, I don't quote the Bible to me, I, I haven't decided that I'm going to believe in that book, then some of these other pieces of data are helpful to have in hand. So yes, it is important. We go to the second item. And this item in the teaching picture is the cradle and the babe in the cradle. And this is the artist's way of reminding us that Jesus Christ was born of a woman. Jesus came into the world through natural childbirth process like you and I did. Now he was conceived differently, but he was born the same way you and I were born. That's what that refers to. I don't know what that does for you, but for me, it warms my heart. You know, he might have come on some kind of a magic carpet uh, with all kinds of servants uh, fanning to, and, and come as a full grown adult and, and have people who were serving him and uh, sort of a potentate and and, and now I'm going to give my press conference, and now I'm going to give a major speech, and all of those kinds of things that we would do in the contemporary world. But Jesus came in the same way we came. And that tells me this. He identifies with the human race, lives that he came to redeem. Now, we're going to think about whether identification 
of Christ with us is important. I believe it's very important because it helps us, it helps me, to identify with him. I can identify much better with Jesus of Nazareth, a flesh and blood person who lived in the first century, than I can with a God in Greek mythology. <coughs> All right. So let's move from this particular thing and ask the question, uh, how do we explain uh, this baby being born as a sinless human being. You know that all the way through the Gospels and through the, uh, the New Testament writers, the statement is made that he is sinless. And you and I know that in the epistles, it is clearly stated in the book of Romans, for example, and in 1 Corinthians, that sin is inherited from Adam. As an Adam all die. So Adam's sin has negative repercussions that extend to the whole human race. We do not come into the world uh, as innocent babes. <clears throat> we come already with the taint of sin on us. In sin did my mother conceive me, writes the psalmist in Psalm 51. That has nothing to do with the, the sect act, which God says is good. It has everything to do with the condition that God says we come into the world with. All right, so then the question arises, how could Mary, a person who is herself a sinner, you know, when you read in the Magnificat, in the Gospel of Luke, after this announcement that was given to Mary, she praises God. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 47, she writes, she says, Oh, how I praise the Lord, how I rejoice in God, my Savior. And the New Testament commentator says, Mary recognized her need. She was a sinner like other people. All right. How can a sinful mother have a sinless child? And the answer that we have given at least in the Protestant heritage, Protestant tradition through the years, is found in the same chapter in verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the babe born to you will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Now the Roman Catholics have gone about this in a little different way. Uh, early on in 1854, uh, they posited the Immaculate Conception. And just so you have a little background and information, this is not a crucial difference between Protestants and Roman Catholics, perhaps, but at least for your information. The Immaculate Conception refers to uh, not Jesus, but to Mary. Her mother, Anna, immaculately conceived, according to this dogma, a sinless child named Mary. So therefore you have sinless Mary. And then obviously from there it follows that a sinless mother could have a sinless child. That's a difference. The Protestant belief is that the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit on Mary, a sinful mother, enabled the child to be born that is holy, sinless. All right, there you have this part about the cradle and the infant. We move now to the deal that deals with this dirt in the hand, and it falls down into the ground area here. The hand and dust, and I give you what I call a shortened version of what that means. This is shorter than what you have in your Bethel notes. What it really means is that Jesus was fully human. Okay, can you hang on to that one? <laughs> Jesus was fully human. And I think that uh, the dust, uh, you know, uh, how were we created? 
all right, from the dust of the earth, all right, our humanness, all of that is symbolized in the dust, okay? So let the dust in this picture, that handful of dust, refer to the fact that Jesus is a human being, all right? Now we're getting into something that is very close to what we traveled uh, through in study number two, where we talked about the humanness of Christ and the divineness of Christ. And here we are emphasizing the fact that Jesus Christ is fully human. He was tempted. It wasn't just play acting. He was in all points tempted like as we are, says the writer of Hebrews. And he did get tired. And he was hungry. And in the garden, when he prayed, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And he perspired his sweats of blood, uh, drops of blood. That is not just idle talk. That is a human being struggling. Now, in a moment, we're going to see the halo, which emphasizes that he is also fully God. But now we're emphasizing the fact that he struggled with things of life like we struggle with them. So the question that we have as we go to the break in your study sheet is if he was fully divine as well as fully human, wouldn't his divineness diminish the reality of the temptations and the tiredness and the hunger? So you've got to struggle with that. You've got to deal with whether he really did identify with us or not. How complete was his identification with our human limitations? Okay, this is a study that calls for your thinking caps. And then the second question is, does it really matter that he actually and really was like us? And I give you three passages of scripture to work with. Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, Hebrews 4, 15, Philippians 2, 6 and 7. And so what I want you to do is go to work and read those passages of Scripture, and then we'll talk about it. We continue now with our study number three, and we deal with the next segment, and that treats that part in the study picture where you have a halo over the head of Jesus of Nazareth. Just as the dust referred to the fullness of Christ's humanity, so now the halo refers to the fullness of Christ's deity. There you've got both things firmly emphasized. And just as it is all important, as Hebrews chapter 2 states, that Christ identify with the human race that he came to redeem by taking on flesh and blood and being fully a human, so now we are emphasizing that the saviorhood, that is to say the capacity of Christ to be our savior and to forgive sins and to atone for our sins rests on the fact that he is fully God. So I give the question, could an angel have pulled it off? Could an angel be our savior? The Bible says no. It takes one who is very God. Who has the power to atone for the weight of the sins of the world, only God. So it's a power issue. An angel could not handle that task. It takes one who is very God to deal with the task of being a savior. Secondly, it also deals with the issue of right. Only God has a right to forgive sins. Now, for example, if someone came off 
the elevator stepped into the room here and uh, just did a number on, well, just any one of you. And, and, and you witnessed a character assassination. And this person just gave all kinds of bald-faced lies about you. So this person now walks off the room, and I follow that person. And I say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Go in peace. Well, you'd be up in arms. You would say, what right have you to forgive that person? That person did not offend you. That person offended our friend in the class here. And that's the only person that has a right to forgive the offender. Now when David committed sin with Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet pointed his finger and said, you are the man, David wrote Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, David said, against thee, O Lord, and thee only have I sinned. Now sure, David had sinned against Uriah and against Bathsheba and against the nation for what he did. But foremost, he had betrayed a faith and trust in his Lord God. And David is reminding us that sin has two dimensions. The primary dimension is the vertical one. We sin against God. Then it follows, does it not, that only God has the right to forgive sins? He's the one against whom we ultimately have sinned. So by virtue of power to do it and the right to do it, only God can be our Savior. Does that make sense? And so the creeds and the scriptures affirm he is fully God and he can be our savior by virtue of that. You see, the people that uh, were round about the, uh, the ecclesiastical establishment just had their cage rattles to no end when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. They couldn't handle that. They plotted to kill him. That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Well, sure, Jesus is God. He can forgive sins. So there you have the whole subject of the halo on the head of Jesus of Nazareth. Now let's move on to the issue of the fact that Jesus of Nazareth had a bowed head. And the key concept there is submission. And that's why the bowing of the head before the Heavenly Father is a very apt symbol. When you see that picture and you see the bowed head, you say to yourself, Jesus was totally submissive to the Heavenly Father. He said, it is my meat, or it is my food, to do the Father's will. And uh, preeminently, this is described for us in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was just moments before he would go to trial and hours before the crucifixion. And Jesus knew the dimension that was before him in terms of the gravity of the crucifixion where the sins of the world would be placed on him. And he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Do we need any more evidence that Christ submitted his will to the Father's will? Well, what we've got in the Bethel materials is a good explanation about where we are today as it relates to the submission of the will by drawing in the two Adam concept. The Bible teaches that there's the first Adam, that's the Adam and Eve, and there is the second Adam, namely Jesus Christ. And in the passages that I give you there to read, it clearly states for just as through the disobedience of one man, that's the first Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, that's the second Adam, the many will be made righteous. That in some translations is called the first Adam and the second Adam. And we 
struggle with the same issue that Jesus struggled with, namely submission to the will of God. And so when we think of Jesus, we have to think of him as a person who really needed to struggle through. He came out saying, not my will, but thine be done. And I asked the question, why are we such strong, self-willed people, so reluctant to do what Jesus did? It's because we're following the first Adam who was self-willed. And that got him into trouble. And so we, we're, you know, Frank Sinatra popularized that song, I did it my way, that we're those, that's, that's us, that's us. And uh, so the question is in your sheet, why are we so self-willed and what can we do about it? So I want you to break and we're gonna have a discussion on that question. How can we follow the example of Jesus Christ? And we start with item number six. You'll notice the crown, very similar to the crown that was on the head of the man in picture number one of the Old Testament. And what that crown reminds us of is that Jesus Christ is a wonderful portrayal of human life you and me, as God originally intended it to be. I don't know how often that's been emphasized. I don't think it has been emphasized much in the places where I went to Sunday school and in the churches where I heard messages and in Bible studies that I attended. But it's very, very solidly biblical. So we need to have a sense that what we have in the person of Jesus Christ is a human being who really shows us what our potential is. Now, you know what the rub is. We are prone to say, I don't buy that. He's God and I'm a plain vanilla human being. So don't ask me to replicate and to begin to show what Jesus Christ shows. Do you see the subtlety of that error? That is so to emphasize the deity of Christ that you diminish the power of his humanity. Then we come to this whole matter of the, uh, the obedience of, of Christ. And the, the flower deck staff shows that he not only submitted his will to the Lord, but he said, I'm going to go and do the will of the Lord. Obedience. Submission is followed by obedience. And the flowers on that staff clearly indicate that the blessings and the powers and the potentiality that God has in mind for his people then flow to a person who is obedient. And the final thought is the shaft of light that emanates from heaven above where you have the statement of Jesus, I am come that you may have life and have it to the full or abundantly. So fullness of life flows from submission and obedience and God's blessings and powers flow to people who do that. All right, now if we really take the humanity of Christ seriously and that he was a person like us except sin and then we go on and say Let's take a look at the secret of Christ's life. Let's not just say, well, he was God and close the book. 
I can't identify it. I can't begin to deal with that example. No, 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 no. Go through the Gospels. Was he a man of prayer? He was. Did he need to commune with the Father before daybreak and when he was all alone? He did. Did he know the Bible? He quoted it again and again and again. He was a person who was immersed in the scriptures. Now that tells me something about where submission and obedience comes from. We're living in a world where we get all kinds of competing messages. And in the discussion period, I heard uh, the statement that one of the things that really gets through to us is we see it all around. We take our values from our society. The media tells us something about where we're at as a society by the kinds of sitcoms that they put on. It's the American way of life. We need rather to immerse ourselves in the power of God and the understanding of God through scripture and, 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 and we need to ask God that the Holy Spirit that he gives to us would flood our life and control us. See, I think that we have a problem of motivation. I think we have a problem of desire. The psalmist said, I desire to do thy will, O God. Now, who is the motivator? The Holy Spirit is the motivator. We need to pray, Lord, help me to desire the things that you desire for my life. I delight to do thy will. This is evidence of God's Holy Spirit moving in our life, taking control, helping us to delight in what God delights in. And I don't know where you are, but to counteract our culture and to keep our heads on straight as Christians, we need to appropriate what Christ appropriated. And that is where obedience flows from, where the fullness and abundance of life flow from. A lot of Christians are not happy Christians. They're not happy campers in the church because they're trying to do things that they know are in the Word but which are things that they struggle with. We're, we're educated way beyond our obedience level. See? The answer is to do what Christ did. Become people of prayer. We read a little book this summer called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And I've mentioned this to some of you by Jim Simbala. And it is a wonderful read. And the secret that is given in that book, the story of Brooklyn Tabernacle in the down in the mouth church in the Brooklyn part of New York City came to life. Miracles were shaped. Tremendous things happened because they became people of prayer. People of the word and people of prayer. That's a secret of Christ's life. And that's where I come down in terms of seeking to appropriate what Christ as our example gives to us in, in this study. And with that, we close our study of number three in the New Testament.